Oh, are you recording? <coughs> is this is this it? <coughs> Again, I apologize for my throat. It'll take about ten minutes. Hopefully, it'll be blown out here. Book of Revelation, chapter twenty-one. Book of Revelation, chapter 21, verse 23. <clears throat> and the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did light it, and the Lamb is the lamp, the lamp or the light of it. The lamb is the lamp or the light of it. <clears throat> um, one thing we can look forward to then in the future is we won't need electricity. And that's, what, that's the main thing to get out of this verse. <laughs> yeah. We won't need suntan lotion or <clears throat> what is it? UV twenty eight. What? Well, that's jeans. <clears throat> uh, actually, Jesus is the light of the world, right? Amen. Okay. Well, that has nothing to do with this scripture right here, because in two ways, it's not talking about Jesus. It's talking about the Lamb of God, which, yes, it's Jesus, but it is, it is specifically speaking of him as Lamb. <clears throat> and, um, and it's not talking about him being the light of the world, but rather, and you'll find what it is in verse 9 and 10. So Revelation 21, 9 and 10. <clears throat> And there came unto me one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and talked with me, saying, Come here, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. And <clears throat> and so the, the picture of Jesus on the throne is lamb on the throne. He's a lamb on the throne, and that's what it speaks of, particularly of the last few chapters of the book of Revelation. But he's not just the lamb on the throne. The throne is inside of the, the wife of the lamb, is inside the bride, is inside of us. That throne and that lamb and that river that flows out of the throne because the scripture says come here and I'll show you New Jerusalem the wife of the lamb it didn't say some great city that we're going to get to live in it says it's what we're supposed to become to the lamb to the lamb to the lamb and so these verses are not talking anymore about the world. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new, and that scripture is not in reference to future events, but <clears throat> to, to the coming of the Lord, the coming of the Lord in us. And, and here in the book of Revelation, the, at this point, there is, there is no more heaven or earth in the old form, behold a new heaven and a new earth. <clears throat> so it's not talking about him being the light of the world in a, in a sense of needing to shine, you know, into our hearts and get us saved or any of that kind of stuff. This is the relationship that has been formed from the beginning of the book of Revelation until now, and it is a manifestation of what is real what is real, not what is fictitious in our minds or what is our view of things. In fact, <clears throat> um, the, the fact that these verses are declaring that the lamb is, is the light, we uh, kind of the scripture that Scott read and some of the, something that um, <clears throat> Patty said, 
about blindness makes me think of the fact that we would read the book of Revelation and we would see that there won't be any, any more need of light and this and that. And we only see that in light of some future event and some future location uh, instead of seeing that and, and, and seeing it only in terms of like, oh boy, in that day, in that day on the planet, <clears throat> rather than this, this lamb is on a throne inside of New Jerusalem, the wife of the lamb. And to not see that, to not see that, is to miss, you know, the great finale. It's to just say, oh, everything is going to be wonderful one day. And, it'll, I, and I'll pretty much be the same, but everything around me will be, will be so nice for my flesh. Well, I mean, that's the way some people think. I mean, it's, that's, that we're always adding in our flesh to a place that when it gets to a certain place, there is no more flesh. There is no more all of those things that are going on. And so, <clears throat> so we see that, that the, the lamb here is the light of her, the light in her. And she needs no more other things to light or to give her clarity as she looks. <clears throat> and that scripture that we just read, and it carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And he calls it, come, I will show you the, the wife of the lamb, the lamb's wife. When When the bride sees, when the wife of the lamb sees, when we are no longer just Christians and no longer just church members, but we have been joined to him in one spirit and he fills us and his light fills us, lamb light fills us. Not, not in the future, but when, when that, it's probably in the future for most of us, but that's the goal even now. When she sees, she sees in light of him and everything else is darkness. Because you take the light away and he, if he's the only light, then everything else is darkness. She sees in light of him and in light of him in her. Not just in light of Christian doctrines and Christian teachings and this and that, because all that's gone. You don't, you know, you get here in the last part of Revelation, you don't see a whole lot of, of uh, Bible studies going on. You know, this isn't, this isn't Bible study time. Hopefully we've done that, you know, now. Amen? Okay, this side, you're good. This side over here, no, nah, I ain't getting out of it. This side over here, we got another hour after they leave. <laughs> so you could even say that, that his, his life or his light or lamb light or lamb life that is light is her filter. Everything is seen through him that is in her. And... Everything else, as I said, is, is as it were, in form darkness. <clears throat> Let me, uh, we're still here. Let's, we're in uh, Revelation 21. Let's start again with verse 10, and then I want to read the next one. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great silly city, the whole, see, I'm doing it, <clears throat> New Jerusalem, descending out of, of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and Listen to this, having the glory of God, and her light was like a stone, most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. <clears throat> her light, which is the lamb in her, was clear as crystal. Clear as crystal. All right. So when I was reading this, I just wanted to, I wanted to know, you know, I... Here's my, my 
weird mind. I'm reading that and I go, okay, so I, I get that. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that, that this light that is the Lamb isn't just some future thing or meant to be uh, some end time thing. <clears throat> and it's not just a light that's going to be there for all of us, you know, in heaven or something. We won't need lights in heaven. We'll have the Lamb and He'll just shine, you know, and we'll go, oh, you know. Not that big a deal, <laughs> you know. But if it's light in her, in us, in those of us who are born again, those of us who are part of him, then I wanted to understand that light. And so I read that next verse here, and it said that it's, it's you know, in the light in her, and her light was like a stone most precious, her light was like a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. So I comprehended from that that this was pretty clear to her, <laughs> what, what he, that where it was coming from and who it was and where it was located and what its purpose was. <clears throat> but honestly, that's, that's not enough for me just because it's still not... For me, I, I need to shake it out of the trees a little more. And so I, I just began to ask the Holy Spirit, help me see this in, in practical terms. Help me see this in New Testament practical terms. And he sent me over to 1 Corinthians. So if you'll turn there with me. First Corinthians chapter 2. And so what does that light look like in practical terms? He said, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2. This is Paul who's got this lamb light working in him. For I am determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Okay, that's the lamb. Okay. Clear as crystal. Crystal clear to Paul, right here. It's crystal clear. There is no shadows in this. Do you, do you see that, how clear that is when he says that? There are no shadows in this. It's not, well, it's about uh, world evangelization or, you know, if the cross doesn't take us to the ends of the earth, then... It's futile. It's just a doctrine that we're trying to follow or, or any other subject. It's crystal clear. Paul says, I am, and he doesn't say, I'm determined to know the Lamb. I'm determined to know Christ crucified. He says, I'm determined not to know other stuff but him. Okay? And why? That's the, that's the real deal. Why? Because if the lamb is the light, then everything else is going to be darkness. And we know that the lamb, uh, you know, you get that picture out of the book of Revelation where he's sitting on the throne. Lamb on the throne, and this river is flowing out, but it's flowing out of him and her because he, she's inside of him, but it flows out of them. Doesn't that sound good to anybody? Yeah. He, it flows out of them, not just out of him, but out of them. And it produces all this stuff, you know. It, the, it's the river of living water that was supposed to be flowing out of us that Jesus talked about that we never saw that it could be something real and something practical. Out of your innermost being shall flow rivers of living water and da 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 And we go, yeah, Holy Ghost, who? Or something. I don't know what we get, but we don't get that it is the Lamb, life and light flowing out of her, New Jerusalem. And Jesus said that that it, this shall be in you a river. That's what He said. And so when we start comparing some of the things in Revelation that He says, we we find that the fulfillment is something practical, not just some spooky. Stuff, something practical and something real. And one of the things that hit me as we were driving here today, I was meditating on this, 
the, the tree of life that was in the beginning. You remember that? In there with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and a whole bunch of other trees that didn't get named till later. Adam went, pear tree. And it stuck because no, nobody knew any different. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, or everybody came along later and said, why'd you call that a pear tree? You're going to have to talk to Adam, man. He came up with that one. <clears throat> and there's a partridge in it, too. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but what occurred to me was this flow that's going out is feeding the tree of life. The lamb is feeding the tree of life. Read it. You can read it, not, not right now, but, you know, when you get time, read it. The lamb is feeding the tree of life and making it bring forth all these different kinds of fruit. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. The tree of life was right there, and we thought, well, this is it. And God says, you know, don't eat of this one. And he kind of looks over and goes, you know, there's a good one over there. Kind of over in that section there. It's kind of that one. <laughs> but man never ate of that one. He never ate of that tree. Never ate of the tree of life. But there was something greater in the reality of the tree of life. Something on the inside of it. Something of a, of a living thing. And that was the flow from the lamb that fed it and made that tree everything. Paul says, I'm determined not to know except the lamb because that's what's going to produce everything else. Not just, not just produce good stuff to, to combat my bad stuff but to produce stuff that nothing else could produce. The, only the lamb, slain lamb, slaughtered lamb on the throne, <clears throat> can feed it. So, she says, you know, if he inside of her, or inside of us as Christians, if he inside of us is enthroned and he's the slaughtered lamb, not just the, it's because it doesn't give us a picture of that. I mean, I was, I was thinking about that. Just, I, it's, it really hit me. In fact, I was on stage when I did, and I had my phone, and I said, thank God, you know, and y'all thought I was texting, you know, somebody. But I was writing down what the Holy Spirit just said to me. And he said that in Revelation chapter 5, <clears throat> everybody is, you know, weeping, looking for answers, <clears throat> and... One of the angels, I think it was, says to John, Weep not for the, the lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed. <laughs> praise God. Praise God. Yeah, the lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed. You know what? There's a difference between hearing and seeing. Because when we hear the truth, when we hear the truth, and we're not seeing Jesus, we're not seeing by the Holy Spirit Jesus, we're seeing things, we're seeing a lot of things. And we're looking, and we're seeing lion, we're seeing tribe of Judah, we're seeing, you know, root, you know, of David, uh, or whatever that, uh, that it's mentioning there. We're seeing all of these things but we're interpreting only according to what we've heard because we have not yet seen. Does that make sense? But it says he turns and looks and he sees. And when he sees, he sees a slaughtered lamb. That's what he sees. When he sees, he sees a slaughtered lamb. Now, was, was Jesus called the lion of the tribe of Judah? Yes. But how do we interpret that? Right? We interpret it according to our hearing. We interpret it a lot of times according to our need. I need a line. <laughs> right now, I need a line. You know? Well, that's fine. But when the time comes, and, and, and never forget this, that lamb on the throne is the one that prevailed. That's what it says. Did he prevail? Well, how did he prevail? Through the cross. That's how he prevailed. 
There's nobody saved. There's nobody in the family that didn't come through the cross. Amen? So, but, but even if you don't turn to look, even if you only hear he's the lion of the tribe of Judah, he's still the one who prevailed. But God wants us to see him. God wants our eyes open. God wants it not hearing me or anybody else teach. Because even if I'm saying lamb on the throne, that's pretty much worthless to you until you turn and see. See, I mean, you know, you would think, well, if somebody said lion of the tribe of Judah, I would know it's the lamb. Yeah, how? Well, well, I heard Randy say it, and it's got to be true because we know how what a great and wonderful guy he is. Wrong. Wrong. First of all, I'm not great and wonderful, or I wouldn't have needed Jesus. <laughs> That's why I'm a saint or whatever you want to call it, not a Catholic saint. <laughs> So it doesn't matter who says what, lamb or lion or anything else, if you don't see, because then you won't know for sure. And there will be a day that you will see. But I'm not talking about by revelation. I'm talking about that you may be faced with the reality of, oh, my God, you know. All right, so anything that doesn't include the lamb, darkness. Why? Because if, if it's not, then you're just raising up the old creation. You're raising it back up. You're raising up the old creation that Jesus died to put away. You're, you're taking in darkness and death that Jesus went to the cross as lamb of God to put away, and you're giving it life again, you know? Well, you know, the, it's, it's just my flesh. I remember when I was in Bible school, I remember certain people just say that, and they'd do something wrong, and they go, well, it's just my flesh. The flesh has been crucified. Jesus isn't going to come back and crucify your flesh. <laughs> Amen? We're supposed to reckon ourselves dead and we, somebody, somebody said to me, yeah, but it says also to reckon ourselves alive. It says reckon yourself alive unto God through Jesus now. Yeah. Not just alive by Jesus, through. That's different. See? But we're not going to see that unless we can hear that and then we'll interpret it according to our minds. We're not going to see it unless we see him. We're not going to see the scriptures correctly unless we begin by seeing him and let everything else fall into its place. He is the explanation of the word of God. Amen. He is. He is that explanation. So <clears throat> to not see it in light of the lamb, then we're declaring the old again. We're running around declaring that. We're declaring things that God says is put. That's not just dead. That's buried. You are, you are bringing up unburied death. You are bringing up things that in, in my heart, through my son, through the Lamb of God, were put away, and you're justifying them. I like, I like what it says here, um, <clears throat> verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 2. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. And then he says, For I am determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Um, let's read on. Um, and my speech and my preaching we're not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. One thing, uh, or a couple of things. Verse 1 ends with the testimony of God. It, it says that my speech and wisdom declaring to you the testimony. I didn't come to declare the testimony of God with speech. 
Okay, book of Revelation again. You go through the book of Revelation, the two witnesses, the word witness and testimony are the same Greek words, and you go through there and you're gonna find that the testimony in the book of Revelation is every time, just like the witnesses, when, when those two witnesses are killed, when the testimony is finally finished, the fe see, because they preached for a while. They preached for this amount of time. But when they died, the testimony was finished. When they gave themselves, when they were of one spirit with the Lamb, then the testimony was over, and then heaven rejoiced, and earth got some more plagues. <laughs> woo <-hoo! clears throat> And then uh, the verses after uh, verse 2 here, he says, I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. And he says he did that so the power of God. Okay, so how do we, if we only hear and we don't see, how are we going to translate that word power of God? We're going to say, well, I, I didn't come to preach with smart words, but I used the power of the Holy Spirit. Glory. Okay. <clears throat> if I'm blaspheming the Holy Spirit right now, may I drop dead? Just kidding. It's not blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came to declare Christ and a few verses, just a few verses. What do we got? Three, four verses from here. It tells us what is the wisdom and power of God. It is Christ crucified. It says that. It tells, see, it, uh, he doesn't go, okay, the wisdom and, and power of God is Christ crucified. And then five verses later, he goes, the uh, power of God, and he's using it in some other context. And, and just follow out 1 Corinthians. It keeps going with this. <clears throat> it is not many wise, not many noble, but I've chosen the weak thing. Oh, I come to you in weakness. See, that's just four verses in front. He's choosing the weak things and the things that are not. And da 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 da. And so Paul says, I'm coming in the power of God. So that God's power by the Lamb can flow out of him through me, but it's a different kind of power. It's a life-giving power. The first man was of the earth earthy. The second man was a life-giving spirit. Life-giving spirit. <clears throat> All right, so let's, let's go to Genesis now. Because we talked about the old uh, and, and see how we see things if we don't hear it from the Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. Genesis 2 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. <coughs> okay? A living soul. So man is made from the dust of the earth. If, if he never fell, <laughs> if he never fell and got an old nature, he would still be dust. And he clearly didn't see the tree of life. He didn't taste of it and he didn't get what was flowing in that tree into the fruit and into him. He went further with that dust. And we say, well, well, how did he, how did he sin? I thought, somebody said this to me years ago. They said, well, I, well, Adam was perfect. When God made Adam, he was perfect. And I said, if he was perfect, he wouldn't have sinned. Right? I mean, because you, you're perfect. You know? I mean, some, you know, also someone said, you know, nobody's perfect. And I said, I'm a nobody. I don't know why I say this. But, <laughs> but anyway. So, um, man's made from the dust, and as soon as he partakes of that fruit, then he begins to judge by another knowledge. And that's uh, chapter 3 and verse 5. <clears throat> For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. Oh my God, folks, there's an eye, there is an opening of our eyes that isn't to Jesus. 
But eyes can be open to stuff and it not be Jesus. That's why you have to see Jesus. You have to ask the Holy Spirit, reveal, like Paul did, reveal your son in me. No, uh, um, in the day you eat, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Okay, he means you'll be like God in this area. He knows good and evil, but he also has other stuff at work in him. God does, right? Like the, this nature, this spirit, this self-giving thing. So he can handle having stuff in him and knowing things and not judge by it. See, because if God lived by the knowledge of good and evil, we'd all be in trouble. Because because we're evil. <laughs> you figure it out. <laughs> you figure it out. You know, here's a calculator. Uh, yeah, you know. So he, but he has that, he has that ability to see good and evil, but thank God he has the ability to see through that. Man judges the, on the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart, you know? And of course we go, yeah, thank God, you know, and, you know, because my heart is pure, you know? And he says it's, it's deceitfully wicked because the proof is that you think it's good. <laughs> <laughs> proof that it's deceitfully wicked is you're fooled and so am I. <laughs> um, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good, it's good, this is good for food. Oh, okay. Um, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise. See, she's not partaking of this trying to be bad. She says, good, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat of this tree, and then I'm going to go get drunk, and then I'm going to go out, and I'm going to party all night long, and then I'm going to do all kind of bad stuff. I'm going to steal from other people. <laughs> good, thank you. There are no other. Yeah. <laughs> so... No, she's, she's, she goes, this looks good. It's, it's desirable. I mean, it was pleasant to the eyes. It's a tree to be desired to make one wise. This, this is what I want. Folks, any way to, to be made wise so that you can be more like God that does not involve the tree of life and does not involve the cross, in other words, and does not involve... Um, your death is going to leave you alive and you'll pervert everything. I, I, will, I know this for me. We will pervert everything to some way, some because we twist things and we bend it and we make it all try to fit us. You know? And if, and if this person does that and then this person does that, then they're going to have a different view than you. And then you're going to use the knowledge of good and evil to see them as evil because they don't agree with you. And then you're going to see them as evil because they don't agree with you. And then we're all judging one another based on a wrong premise. Amen? <laughs> she also gave it to her husband with her. I thought it was interesting to call her her husband. I just kind of like that, you know? I mean, they didn't really, you know, da, 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 you know what I mean? I mean, that, see, our minds are so weird. You have to, da, da, there has to be this particular ceremony. It has to look a certain way. Now you're married. They didn't even jump over a broom or something, you know what I mean? I mean, it was just, you know. Sorry, that's the original roots, but. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, they didn't do that. I mean, you know, and you get that picture again with Isaac and, and uh, Rebecca. What is it? Yeah. <clears throat> and he ate. Then the, then the eyes of both of them were opened. <gasps> now we can see what's right and wrong. Oh, no. Oh, no, we're naked. This can't be right. 
If that's true, don't ever take a shower unless you got your clothes on or something like that. You know what I mean? Because we're so weird. We're so weird. Aren't we weird? Yes. We are. We are. I am. <laughs> uh, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. All right, where are you getting the thread? Where's these needles coming from? Anyway, never mind. <clears throat> See, I mean, I, my, I really do just, whoa, what? <laughs> whoa. <laughs> my mind is like that. It's, it's, I just see all this stuff and go, what? And then I, but I ask. Then when I don't know, I go, what is this? Because I don't get it. <clears throat> so his eyes were open, but only to good and evil. That's, do you see that? Their eyes are open, but only to good and evil now. They don't have the tree of life. They don't have another, they don't have God's view of things. That it's not according to the Lamb. It's not according to the cross. It's according to stuff in the natural. And if you had the light of the Lamb on the inside of you, you wouldn't be judging after that kind of stuff. Every, you'd see everything through Him. Yes. Through the Lamb. Through that Spirit. Through, through Him living in you. <clears throat> so, I wrote down, Adam's judgments were based upon himself. He, he, they are his judgments. Adam's judgment, his judgments. His, they're his judgments. They're only his judgments. He's seeing from dust. He's seeing his face is still in the earth. He's seeing what's wrong, not you know, he hasn't entered into selflessness by the Lamb. You know, the, the, the truth is that you and I, we still eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Does anybody agree with me over that? But we still do that. We, <clears throat> we judge things not based on the light of the Lamb, not based on, well, they're dead, you know, they're crucified just as much as I am or whatever. We see things based on the knowledge of good and evil. And we do it on a regular basis. And I'm going to be honest with you. And when, we're, when someone shares or whatever and convinces us that we do still judge by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we're not shamed by that. We're, we make no effort to change that. We, we don't give it another thought other than, yeah, I, I think I do that. I mean, I don't know how to express that. I wish I could tell you a story that deeply affected me. But this was early on in the Lord. And um, <clears throat> uh, before I came to Berea, and I was with a group <clears throat> that uh, there was a certain amount of deliverance being done. People were, you know, praying over people and talking about demons and stuff like that. And... Um, and I'd been around it long enough to see people, you know, yeah, well, well, you have a demon, so let's pray for it, uh, or whatever. But there was this, there was this uh, brother that was brought in to one of our meetings, and we, this wasn't full-blown church type meeting. This is <laughs> Jesus freak meetings, you know, in our house, and we're praying for one another and stuff, but. Um, he came in a little late and so when he walked in we were about to pray and someone said well we're going to we're going to pray for brother so and so here because he's got a demon and this brother that came in broke down crying broke down crying and said oh my god oh my god you in Jesus' body, there's a demon, you know, in someone that, that loves Jesus, they've got a demon in there, and just cried and wept and went, well, oh, no. You know, and we're all going, yeah, yeah, they got a demon. You know, and my kind of, it was like, we're all just used to the terminology and the deal and stuff, and this person just went, we, we shouldn't be with Jesus. We shouldn't have this stuff in us, and it wasn't a condemnation. It was like, oh, no. For, for Jesus' sake, that, we shouldn't have these things in us, but 
I can't imagine us allowing that, you know, being free and easy and, you know. And some of us uh, broke down ourselves and just went, oh my God, I'm, we're barely Christians and we're already so, not hard, but um, I don't know, insensitive, insensitive to the, the way things really are. We, 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 you know, you get far enough away from the lamb and you get insensitive and you just take things as they are and you go, oh, well, that's, that's Christianity or whatever. And I'll never forget that day. I'll never forget it. Just deeply, deeply has, has touched me and has made me where I don't want to go. I don't want to get that in that place. Anyway, I mean, you know, we get confronted with the, the fact that we're functioned by the knowledge of good and evil. You know, for, I think for most of us, maybe not in this room, but for most of us, we... We just hear it, we acknowledge it, and we think that's good, that we've acknowledged it or something. But there's no like, oh my God, that's the very thing that brought the fall, or that's that's hurts Jesus. He didn't want us to, you know, to to be eating of this and judging based on it. It was in his heart from the very beginning that this wouldn't be part of who we were, but now we are. And anyway, I didn't didn't mean to. Stay on that. Uh, Deuteronomy <clears throat> chapter 1. Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse uh, 39. <clears throat> and this is, this is Moses rehearsing what happened when they got out of Egypt and made the trek all the way across the wilderness and they got to the edge of the land and they didn't enter in. And they didn't enter in and they, they made excuses for their kids. You know, well, our kids, our kids, this is, you know, our children, you know, there's giants in there and... <clears throat> And they didn't say, well, you know, we're, we're afraid for ourselves or anything. They were just using their kids as an excuse to do something that wasn't the Lord, to flow in a manner that wasn't the Lord. And they just didn't feel any compunction of guilt either over that. It's just that same, that same thing that worries me for me, not you. I mean, yes, but um, <clears throat> so Moses is relating this story. And so he finally comes to verse 39 where he just says, now here's the, here's the deal. He says, um, moreover, your little ones and your children who you say will be victims, I'm reading from the NIV, moreover, your little ones and your children who, who you say will be victims who today have no knowledge of good and evil, they shall go in there. They're going into the land. To them I will give it, and they shall possess it. All right. Now, this is spiritual. You know, this is, this is the Lord. You know, this isn't an issue of doctrine, whether kids, you know. This is, a, this is God trying to communicate something to us. Um, and I just don't want to miss stuff. I don't want to read and just miss stuff. So, so who's going in? The children, the, the ones that they made victims of, said they're the, they're, they'll be victims. This will not be good for them. This will be hurtful to my children. So we can't do this. And it was just an excuse because, you know, the land was filled with milk and honey. God said, I've already given it to you. And it was just an excuse because they were afraid you know, of the giants or something like that. <clears throat> so why are they going in? Because why? They have no what? Knowledge of good and evil. That's why they're going in. You say, you're full of it. You're, you're judging by good and evil and giants and, and this and that, and you're, you're measuring 
I've given you the land, and you're measuring the land by your knowledge of good and evil, and the giants are evil, and the fruit is good, but the giants win in your mind, and I'm telling you, I win. I will bring you in. I didn't say you're going to go in and do it. I said I will, and so we're, you know, and we'll, but we're right because it's, it's about our children. No, you're, you're dead wrong. Dead wrong. The other reason why they're going in, because we know this spiritually, is because they don't partake of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They don't partake of it. They don't do it. And they don't partake of that way of judging. The, you have to understand this. To get in this place and to be able to enter it, the lamb is the light. You're not seeing by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the tree of life, yes, amen, but the lamb is even empowering it. Yes, amen. You know? It's empowering the cross. The cross in itself without the lamb on it is nothing. That's right. That's right. Amen. Amen. So where are they going into? What are they going to, where are they going? They're going into the land. This was the whole deal. Every Christian can go, you know, this is a picture of us when we were unsaved. And really it's not that. It's greater than that. They were already the people of God before they even went down there. But nonetheless, you know, this is a picture of us getting, coming out of Egypt and getting saved. I mean, going across the wilderness and entering into the land. And seeing it all in our, in the mirror that reflects our face somehow. But it is, there, meant, there is this place when, when God said to Moses, I will bring you out and I will take you into a land that pleases me, that is, I've chosen. They're, here they are, <clears throat> they're at the edge of it, and here we do it, and here we do it to him again. No, I'm, you know, I've been eating at the wrong tree, and yeah, it's not right, but I ain't going in there because I'm afraid. Where are your eyes? Where's your faith? Where's your heart? So God says, somebody's going to enter in. <laughs> And I'll bring your children. The ones that you were calling victims in this situation, I'm going to turn around and I'm going to bring them in. And you're not going to go in. But they will go in. And what are they going to do? What are they going to gain when they get in there? They're going to possess the land. They're going to possess. They're not just going in. See, because you can go in and not possess. A lot of Christians will wander. You know, the 12 spies, you know, 10 of them wandered around and went, oh, look, look. And then they went right back outside of the land and they're showing it around. But they went, yeah, but see, you see what I'm saying? They saw how big the fruit was and everything, but they went in and they came out. They were visitors to the land. To the land. They were not inhabitants. Okay. We can do that in our own walk, too, with, with the Lord. So they're going to go in not judging by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they're going to go in because they're partaking of another kind of seeing. Remember where all this started when I started preaching? Not just hearing, but turning and seeing what are these words. These words are all, you know, can you imagine Book of Revelation 5 when they says, Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed. And they go, these are words that have been so powerful over, our, over all the years and so powerful in the word of God and, and so impacting. And this is, you know, the, yes, 
Praise God, it's the promise of the lion of the tribe of Judah. It was the promise of the Messiah. Praise God, praise God. And they could sit there and do that the whole time. And, they, and if they did, they'd be worshiping the wrong image. But, they, but John turned and he looked. And he, he saw God's definition. He didn't hear God's definition. He saw it. No man can give you God's definition. They can't. They can t they can, you can hear it from somebody, but no man can give you that. You have to see that. <clears throat> All right. Um, if it's any consolation to you, I'm not getting close at all. All right, let's turn to the uh, Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 18. How, Shay, how much time do I have left up there? Eight minutes. Okay, I should be able to. Nah. <laughs> uh, eight, uh, Luke 18, <clears throat> it'll be, we'll start with verse 16. See, the good news is, we're coming up on lunchtime right now. And if I go longer than all the churches will have let out at noon, eaten in the restaurants, and there'll be plenty of room for us. And the people that are hungry are going, no, I'd rather fight the crowd. <clears throat> well, I'm glad I told you that because I'm way over here in John and I'm supposed to be in Luke. <clears throat> Luke chapter 18. And verse 16. <clears throat> but Jesus called them unto him and said, Permit little children to come unto me, for forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God like a little child shall in no wise, no way, enter in. <clears throat> All right. One of, one of the things I have found with the with God in the New Testament is he hearkens back a lot to the Old Testament and he puts he, he says you're doing the same things that they were doing you know so instead of rebuking you presently for what you're doing he uses the wandering in the wilderness and you know da 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 and he says that's that's you until da 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 anyway <clears throat> in this situation one of the things to realize is He's not talking about children. I'll prove it because I'm going to give you another thing. But he's not talking about, he's talking about are you one of those that's going to enter in? And if so, you're going to have to do it like a child. Now, we see, we need all kind of definitions of that, don't we? I mean, we need to, we really need to lay hold of that picture. But, so, so some of the key words here is, Whoever does not receive the kingdom as a little child will well, by no means enter in. Again, I'm using the NIV here. So he's talking about entering in, and he's talking about children doing it. But if you're not like a child, then there's no way it's going to happen. All right? So let's go um, to uh, Mark now, Mark chapter 10. And it's really just the same thing, but a little bit reads just a little bit differently. <clears throat> Mark chapter 10 and verse 14. 14 or 15. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, Let the little children come to me. And do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say unto you, Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter in. And then he took them up in his arms and he laid hands on them and blessed them. But who, who is he talking to here? He's talking to disciples and he's talking to disciples about you need to become like a little child. But our definition of that has always been we've seen a little group of children and we say, yeah, you're too adult. You act too adult. You need, to, you need to become more innocent and little like a little child. And you need to, you know, and then God will love you. <laughs> That's not what he's saying. He's talking about entering in. 
He's talking about be, uh, that you must become as a little child. His emphasis is that. And what we read was the child that he's talking about is the one who no longer eats of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He's going to enter in. He's going to enter in. It's powerful. And go over those scriptures several times, and I, they'll pop out even more. They're really, it's really, it's really good. It's really good stuff. <clears throat> uh, a couple of points in these verses here. Let the little children come to me. Well, to do that, it's not just come to Jesus in a robe and run up like a little child and sit in his lap and go, <laughs> Jesus. It is to come to the crucified. The lamb, the lamb must be enthroned must have his flow, must have his release. So let's see. He's not just talking about these children. He's talking about the ones who enter in. He's talking spiritually about what? About those who become as a little child. In what way? They do not walk in the knowledge of good and evil. Who enters in? The ones who first come. They first come to the cross, to the Lamb, and that no, the, who enters in those that no longer come to the other tree, those that are looking at Jesus, not others. Because remember, we're talking about judging by the light of the Lamb or judging by the, by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Judging by what's wrong. And, you know, we can even turn the knowledge of good and evil against ourselves. We can judge ourselves, you know, by the knowledge of good and evil. And that's not, that's not any more right or less right than judging someone else. It's still the wrong tree. And if you only saw it the way Jesus does, he, he sees you as his. And if the devil's condemning you, do you think God likes that? No. If the devil's beating you over the head, do you think that he likes that? No. What about if you're beating you over the head? He goes, stop that. Be with me. See what I've done, not what, what's yet lacking or what you think is lacking. When we were, uh, when I was in Ireland, was thinking about the road to Emmaus. <clears throat> I was thinking about the disciples walking along, and Jesus had died, and, but now he was risen. And the disciples are walking along, and it says they walk along, and they were sad, and they were discouraged. And why, and that's, here's what the Spirit of God just came on me and said, why are they sad and discouraged? And he said, because they have misinterpreted the cross. They think it's all over with, or they think it, this can't be applied anymore, or this doesn't have power. Or, yeah, are you following? The, the, this, this, you know, they're going, oh, this is, you know, in this situation, it's helpless. They misinterpreted the cross. And Jesus drew near, and he's going, you know, I, I need you to interpret me right. Yes. And it was just, it was so powerful to me when he said that. Let the little children come unto me. Don't lead them to doctrine or ministry or let them come to me, the crucified. Let them, come on, let them do it. When we teach our children in children's church, let them come to him, the crucified. 
Just don't just give them doctrine or ministry. There's enough of that going on. So I just, I wrote out a little summary here of what I shared. And the lamb is the light, her light, and it's in her. He's not shining it down. You know, when Paul met Jesus, he was up there and he shined the light down. But in the end, Paul had that light inside of him and his compass was so strong, so cross-centered, so lamb-centered, so incredibly that. The lamb is the light, her light. It's her light. It's hers. She sees all things by Christ crucified. Adam's fall changed how we see. We judge. We judge. And we think we're right because we can see the difference between good and evil. So this is good and that's evil. So that's my proof that that's wrong. But again, if the devil is accusing you and we say that's evil and then you're, you're allowing yourself to beat yourself down, you might even say that's good because it's humbling me when it's not the Lord. So, our, you know, we just misjudge in, in, compared to the lamb. Compared to the lamb, we misjudge. Adam, let's see, they wouldn't enter in, the children did. Those who still had the knowledge of good and evil and that made excuses and said their children would be victims, so this is what needs to happen. And it seems so right. It seems such a right decision, and it was so wrong. God said, well, that's it then. You won't enter in, but what you thought was victim, I'll take care of them, but I'm not going to take care of you. Unless you feed your children on the knowledge of good and evil. Then they ain't going in either. So they wouldn't enter in. The children did. Why? Because the children didn't have knowledge of good and evil. They weren't judging outwardly we enter in when no knowledge of good and evil is there but the light of the lamb is our only light this is what being like a child represents like like in Deuteronomy 139 this is what Jesus meant when he said, become as a little child so you can enter in. This, this is the definition of being like a child. When he says, except you be like a little child, for such is the kingdom. And this is what entering in is about. Not being guided and the light in you being the knowledge of good and evil instead of the lamb. It, this is what entering in is, to see by the Lamb. To enter the promised land is to leave the cursed one. And to do it in understanding, but not religious understanding, but remember the light was crystal clear. The light in her was crystal clear. So clear. I just saw it in Paul and 1 Corinthians 2 too. Crystal clear, for I am determined not to know anything. He is establishing the light of the Lamb inside of him, except Christ and him crucified. And this will determine, this, this will be the light where I walk, or if, it, if it's not shining over here, I don't go there. I am with this Lamb. I am with him. I am wife of the lamb and I will live as such
Why don't we stand together and we'll just close with a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for your um, desire, like on the road to Emmaus. Thank you for drawing near to us when we are maybe been misinterpreting the cross and coming away with no answers or, or being sad because we thought it was, the cross was going to go a certain way, but it's still victorious and we don't see that. Thank you for drawing near to us. Thank you for opening the word, but more than that, thank you for revealing yourself. And Father, I just ask you, because, the, because you initiated this for your son's sake, and you initiated this in the power of the Holy Spirit, I ask you that you will um, complete the work that you're speaking of, that you're trying to do, that you're trying to make so real in us. Complete the work so that we are his city, his, his wife, his bride. And we have not just on us or around us, but we have in us him who is all of this, filling us, not just in some segment of us that we unaware that he's there and calling it Christ in me, but filling us where we know we're filled with him, we're filled with all the fullness of God, the Lamb of God. So thank you. Thank you. Open our eyes to see, not just to hear. Because you said at the very beginning when you were talking to the churches, you said, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. They weren't even to the place yet where they could see. They were just beginning. And because they couldn't see, there were all the problems that had to be dealt with. But when they began to turn and see the definitions of all those other words, they saw a slaughtered lamb. So, Father, we're with you. We're with your heart. We're with you, Jesus. We're with your heart. We know that you want to be in us. We know that you want to be uh, by your nature in us and not just in us in a theological way. And Holy Spirit, we know that your, your desire is not just to feed the right truths into our ears. But your desire is to open our eyes. Open our eyes, not to the knowledge of good and evil, but open our eyes to who it is that fulfills all these things. We ask you to do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Why don't you go hug a couple of people and bless them in the name of Jesus. We're dismissed. <clears throat>